In this video, we're going to look at the major groups of primates that are alive today and a little bit about the evolutionary history of the primates. This group is an incredibly diverse group of animals, and what we'll see is that part of our story of being human is really related to how our family of primates have evolved over the last 65 million years. Primatologists study non-human primates for a number of reasons, but one of them is to make inferences about the life histories of hominids. So the apes and our ancestors, and then also more specifically, the hominins like us. By understanding how primates live today, we can understand a bit about how our ancestors lived in the past. Paleoanthropologists and paleontologists study fossil hominins and primates and other animals to make similar inferences about life histories. So we'll be looking at both living primates and also fossil primates as we understand how this family has developed over time. There are a number of characteristics that primates have in common and a lot of these we still you know we see the importance of them in the human lineage today. So to start with primates have grasping hands and feet. We have opposable thumbs meaning we can touch our thumbs to our other fingertips. This is a trait that develops early on in our evolutionary history because our earliest ancestors used those opposable thumbs to grab onto tree branches and tree limbs as they were living in this forested environment. Primates also have an increased importance on the sense of sight rather than the sense of smell. So in primates we see that our eyes face forward and that gives us what's called an overlapping field of vision. It gives us stereoscopic vision, meaning that we can determine depth better than some other animals. And obviously, if we think about our little primate ancestors living in trees, you want to know whether that tree branch that you're jumping to is five feet away or 25 feet away, right? That's going to make a, a big difference on your survivability. So we get a lot of information about the world through our eyes. We also get a lot of information about the world through our hands. We rely on our hands much more than our noses to get information around the world. So while a cat or a dog or a deer might sniff things out to learn about them, we tend to reach for things and grab for things. Primates also have an increase in brain complexity and overall brain size. So we have large brains relative to our body size, and that allows for more complex thought, greater social memory, the ability to make cognitive connections between different things. And we see this throughout the primate lineage, but certainly in humans, we have the largest brain relative to our body size amongst all of the primates. And that allows for really, really complex cognition. Primates also have altricial young, which means our babies are born essentially helpless. So therefore we have to invest a lot of time in caring for our offspring. We have to, you know, carry our babies from one place to another. We have to feed them. We have to protect them and keep them warm. We have to invest a lot of time in our infants, especially compared to other animals. If you think about something like a baby deer, you know, they're born and within a couple hours they can at least get up and walk or they know to hide. Human babies, primate babies, not so. Uh, but this is okay because throughout that period of parental investment, this is also the enculturation period. This is when our offspring learn all those very key essential things about how to be a human or an orangutan or a gorilla, right? So we invest, but that's also when the learning happens early on. Finally, primates are very social. Uh, lots of animals are social, but primates are especially social. And we create and build social bonds through food sharing, uh, through grooming, which is what we see a picture of here. And and humans, we're, we're, we take that to a whole another level, right? Um, and, you know, some people will say that because of technology, because of our smartphones, that we're somehow less connected, we're less social than we ever have been before. But I don't think that's true. Uh, I think even in social media, we see how important being social is. Uh, you know, every time we like someone's photo, every time we follow someone on Instagram, that's kind of the human equivalent of picking fleas out of your friend's hair because we're saying, I value you. Uh, you know, I, I see your worth and I'm here to tell you that I am a part of your social group. So we really see sociality being an important part of being primates. If we're going to be looking at 
fossil primates, we have to understand how to interpret those bones, how to read those fossils. And so depending on what type of animal you're looking at, we're going to be focusing on different things. But for our purposes, if we're talking about reading primate fossils, one of the things that we might really focus on are the teeth and the jaws. And that's because teeth are adapted to certain foods, right? Whatever food an animal eats, their teeth are going to reflect that. For example, with cows on the left, we know that their teeth are big and flat, and that's because cows eat grass. So their teeth have to be able to grind up grass continually throughout the day. Their teeth are really big to withstand the stress and the pressure of this constant grinding motion. Compare that to a dog on the right, and their teeth are sharp, and that's because they are carnivores. They're meat eaters that need to pierce flesh and then slice up that meat in their teeth. So teeth show us about the type of food that an animal eats. That then helps us reconstruct the environment that an animal lived in. We know that if we find the teeth of a cow, that means that at some point in the past, when that cow was alive, there must have been sufficient grass there. So teeth tell us about food. Food tells us about environment. Next, if we looked at the skull, and specifically at the eyes, that can tell us the time of day that a primate was active. So here we're comparing a tarsier and a chimpanzee. Looking at the tarsier, you see they've got really fantastically large eyes. Um, and looking at the skull, you can see that each one of their eye sockets, so each eyeball, is actually bigger than their entire brain. That's because tarsiers are active at night, and so those big eyes are necessary to basically trap as much light as they can in an otherwise dark environment. That helps them do all of the seeing that they need to do when the sun isn't out. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, are active during the day, so their eyes are a lot smaller because they don't need to bring in more light than is already available to them. Finally, we can look at the postcrania. This is everything from the neck down. And in primates, we'll focus especially on the curvature and the length of the limb bones to show us how these animals were walking around and what environment they were living in. So if we're looking at the curvature of the bones, look for example at the gorilla arm bones right over here. These are nice curved bones, and curved arm bones and leg bones suggest that these animals spent time in trees, so they're arboreal rather than spending time on the ground, meaning terrestrial. Humans, on the other hand, have very straight limb bones, and that's because we are terrestrial species. Now the length of the limbs also indicates something about the type of locomotion, whether we're looking at primates who are walking on two feet or primates who are walking on four feet. Today, humans are the only true bipedal primates, and we're obligate bipeds, meaning that we have to walk on two feet. And so our legs are long and our arms are short because we don't have to get our arms all the way to the ground anymore. But in the other apes, especially if you're looking at the orangutans or the gibbons on the right, their arms are very long, and that's because their arms have to reach the floor for their quadrupedal locomotion. So again, the curvature and the length of the limb bones will tell us trees or land, and quadrupedal versus bipedal locomotion. So let's start with our ape groups. There are six main ape groups alive today, of which we are one. We can break down the apes into two smaller groups. So we've got the hominids, or the great apes, basically everyone except for the gibbons and the siamangs. And this diagram that we're looking at is a cladogram which shows us the evolutionary relationships of these apes. So for example, it tells us that the bonobos and the chimps are the closest to apes, and then we are the next closest relative to them. Every time these lines meet, that tells us that there was some ancestor in the past, and then that ancestor group broke into two, or someone diverged off of that group and evolved into something else. Within the hominids, we've also got this group, the hominins. The hominins are everything on the line to humans after our split with bonobos and chimpanzees. So we know that we shared a common ancestor with bonobos and chimps probably about 7 million years ago. And then everything that is more similar to us after that split, we call the hominins. Now let's take this and expand it to include all of the primates. Here are our major primate groups, and there's a number of them, although this does not begin to display the diversity that exists within the primates. These are just the major, major primate groups. So to start the story of, of where primates come from and, and how we explain this diversity, 
we really have to go back in time about 65 million years. Now, to set the stage, the world stage, we of course remember that continental drift, the, the idea of plate tectonics, means that the continents have shifted in their position over time. Our story is starting about 65 million years ago, which is represented by this map here. So by 65 million years ago in the Cretaceous period, we see that the Earth is not, you know, one supercontinent anymore, uh, but things aren't quite in the position they're in today. So North and South America were not yet connected. North America is more connected to Eurasia. Here's Africa. That's in pretty much the same position. Uh, but here's India. So India had not yet slammed up into Asia to create the Himalayan Mountains. And then Australia is hanging out down here by Antarctica. It had not yet shifted into place. So there were some differences with the land masses when compared with today. And that's an important part of the story. 65 million years ago was the end of a period that we call the Age of Reptiles. This is the time of the dinosaurs. For about 200 million years, dinosaurs had ruled the Earth. And it's not to say that there weren't mammals alive during that time. Uh, there were, but there weren't the mammals that we think of today. There were no you know, cows or horses or whales or bears, definitely not humans. The mammals that were alive were, were really small. They were almost more, they, more rodenty, I guess you could say, um, kind of living on the fringes. So they were not a dominant force. But 65 million years ago, something happened. Uh, something big happened that changed the entire trajectory of evolution on this planet. And that was a big meteor impact right around the Gulf of Mexico. So right around here. This is called the Chicxulub meteor impact. And when this meteor hit the earth, it immediately caused tsunamis, earthquakes. It would have devastated all of the animals, all of the life in the immediate area. But it also shot ash up into the atmosphere. And that ash ended up basically surrounding the earth and blocking out sunlight. As the sunlight's blocked out, plants begin to die, which means that plant-eating dinosaurs begin to die, which means that meat-eating dinosaurs begin to die because their food resource has, has died. This led to the extinction of dinosaurs, the only exception to that being the dinosaurs that eventually evolved into birds. But with all of those major groups of dinosaurs wiped out, there was a big open space. There, was, there were these open ecological niches for mammals. And so mammals really come into their own after the dinosaurs are extinct. So from 65 million years to the present, we can call this the age of mammals, which also means the age of primates. This is when our story really starts. The earliest primates start evolving right after the dinosaurs disappear and then are widespread by about 55 million years ago. So the earliest groups we see, they're throughout North America, Europe, and Asia, so up in this northern part of the world. And we see, although they don't necessarily look like all the primates that we think of today, they've got those primate characteristics of forward-facing eyes, they've got larger brains, they've got opposable thumbs, and they also have fingernails. And we see this see these features in fossils like this little individual. Uh, this is Ida, who is 47 million years old and found in Germany. This is an early primate, all right? Um, fingernails are something that sets us apart from the rest of the mammals, whereas cats and dogs have claws, uh, horses and goats have hooves. We have fingernails. So our earliest primates are situated down here on our evolutionary line. And so the first group that we're going to talk about in terms of living primates are the lemurs and the lorises. These are called strepsirine primates. So first up, the lemurs, they live in Madagascar and only in Madagascar, but they are highly variable. There's dozens and dozens of species of lemurs, and they come in all shapes and sizes and behaviors that you could imagine. Some are diurnal, meaning they're active during the day. Some are nocturnal, active at night. Some live on the ground, terrestrial. And some live in trees, arboreal. Some eat fruits, some eat insects. Any way you can slice it, these lemurs are doing it in Madagascar. Now, how did they get there? That's a little bit of a mystery, but it's, it's hypothesized that some lemur ancestor made it to Madagascar around 50 to 60 million years ago. Now, Madagascar was already separated from Africa at that point, so they would have had to cross some you know, significant body of water. But it's suggested that some lemur, lemur ancestor, maybe a pregnant female, uh, might have gotten stuck on a tree branch or a log or some, some piece of debris and essentially rafted to Madagascar. 
and then once there, spread out throughout the island and diversified into this incredible array of lemurs that we see today. Our other strepsirine group are the lorises that today live in Southeast Asia. They're nocturnal and they typically eat insects and sometimes fruit. And here we see the slow loris, which is the most common type of loris that we typically see, um, you know, when we're when we're talking about lorises, which I'm sure happens every day. Next up are the haplorine primates. Now haplorines is a name that defines all of the rest of the primates that are not the lemurs and the lorises. Uh, but one specific group of haplorines are the tarsiers, which live in Southeast Asia. Um, they're nocturnal. Again, we see their big eyeballs. So that tells us they're bringing in light in otherwise dark conditions. They also have specialized grooming claws, which is not an uncommon primate characteristic. Uh, but these are basically fingers that have... Um, that have claws rather than fingernails. And these are used for grooming, but also for accessing food resources inside tree branches. So they can kind of like stick those scrawny little fingers into trees and pull out uh, tree sap or also maybe insect larva. And it's a way of feeding themselves. Our next haplorine group is actually a big group that we can break down into a lot of others. These are the anthropoids. Okay, so anthropoid is a group it's a name to describe a big group of primates. Um, and these are the primates that are the very, very primatey primates. These first appear in the Eocene around 50 million years ago. And we see anthropoid fossils throughout Africa, Asia, and Europe. The anthropoids continue with all of those very primate characteristics of forward-facing eyes, um, increased brain size, increased focus on touch, and sight rather than smell. But they're also very small. So here's the lower jaw of an anthropoid that was found in northern Africa. It's about 50 million years old. That's a whole lower jaw. This is a very tiny, tiny little creature. Here are some finger bones of an anthropoid from China that's about 45 million years old. So we're not talking about big gorillas at this point. We're still talking about very, very small little primates. But these early anthropoids competed with the early strepsirines and other haplorines for resources and eventually became very successful at it. So they kind of forced out the other strepsirines and haplorines until we only see just a few of those groups left today, whereas the anthropoids have been very successful over time. The anthropoids we can split into two groups. We call these the platyrines and the catarines. The platyrines are the New World monkeys. These are all of the monkeys that live in Central and South America, and their name means essentially flat-nosed or flat-faced because they don't have much of a snout. It's just kind of, you know, you see face and nostrils. The catarines are the Old World monkeys and apes, which includes humans, and we have more of a snouty face. We've got sharp noses, and so you see that characteristic in the Old World species. The platyrines, or the New World monkeys, arrived in the New World, meaning South America and Central America, by around 40 million years ago. Just like with the lemurs in Madagascar, though, how those monkeys made it to South America is a little bit up in the air. It's a question that's still not completely answered, because by 40 million years ago, Africa and South America are really far apart. So the best explanation at this point is sort of the surfing monkey hypothesis, where some ancestor, some monkey ancestor here in Africa, accidentally floats its way over to South America. And then once in South America, spreads out in this whole tropical region and diversifies into the incredible array of New World monkeys that we see today. All New World monkeys today are diurnal, meaning they're active during the daytime, except for one. There's only one nocturnal monkey. Um, and they they have an incredible array of behavioral adaptations, uh, physical adaptations. They, they get really colorful. And we saw in the previous picture, uh, you know, some of them have beautiful little mustaches, a, a really amazing, amazing diversity of New World monkeys. Many also have prehensile tails, which we see pictured here in the middle. A prehensile tail is just a tail that can be used kind of like another hand uh, to help stabilize a monkey up in the trees. Now the old world monkeys, also known as the Cercopithecoids, are the monkeys that live in Africa and Asia and, you know, a little bit Europe, especially in the past. 
Just like with the New World monkeys, the Old World monkeys are very diverse. Some are large, some are small, some live in trees, some live on the ground. Uh, you tend to see that the larger ones live on the ground, the smaller ones live in the trees, which is also just kind of common sense if you are a very big monkey like a baboon. Being high up in the treetops could be a lot more dangerous. You, you know, a little twig snaps underneath your weight, you're going to make a big splat on the ground. So sometimes people were will refer to the splat effect when it comes to how sizes of monkeys varies according to trees or ground. Uh, but we see those monkeys throughout the African continent and then also East Asia has got its own, you know, myriad different types of monkeys. The other part of the Catarine group after the old world monkeys are the apes or the hominoids. Today, apes live only in Africa and Asia, although in the past we also had apes living in Europe and through a larger portion of the Asian continent. There are two general types of apes or two ways we can break down the ape group into the great apes, the orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and bonobos, and humans. And then the lesser apes were the gibbons and the siamangs. It's estimated that over a hundred different ape species have lived on earth in the last 20 some million years. I'm only going to mention a couple of them here, but apes used to be very, very uh, common and diverse throughout the Miocene, which is a period of time that started about 23 million years ago. So our first Miocene ape that we'll talk about is called Proconsul. This is an East African ape that lived from about 23 to 14 million years ago. It appears to have been a very sexually dimorphic species. Sexual dimorphism is when males and females have a very large physical difference between them. And if we're talking about apes, that dimorphism usually shakes out as males being significantly larger than females. From looking at modern apes, when we see a, a significant degree of sexual dimorphism, it often is because males live in multi-female groups. So the bigger the male within a species, the more likely it is that the larger sort of alpha males have a group of females that only they are allowed to have sexual access to. Uh, so the size of males versus females can help us understand group structure within apes. Proconsul appears to have been both frugivorous and folivorous, meaning it ate fruits and leaves, and its teeth look very much like the teeth of modern apes. So again, it's using that concept of uniformitarianism to understand how teeth and tooth shape relates to foods, and then translating that into the past to interpret what these ancestors would have eaten. Our next Miocene ape group is a group called Pyrolopithecus catalonicus, which is a southern European group, or at least the fossil was found in Spain. This fossil is about 13 million years old, and it's worth mentioning because although it definitely appears to be an arboreal species, meaning that it lived in the trees, it also has evidence for this very apey modern day thing that we see in living apes today, which is knuckle walking. So when apes like chimps or gorillas or orangutans when they walk around on all fours, they don't put the palms of their hands flat on the ground. Instead, their fingers sort of curl and they walk on that middle section of their fingers. Okay, that's called knuckle walking. And it includes this whole adaptation to both allow for the hand to swing back and forth and then also to stabilize it when weight is placed on it. We see this knuckle walking adaptation in this early um, Miocene ape 13 million years ago. So we know that that characteristic was present by at least that point in time. And the last Miocene ape I'm going to mention, my favorite, this is Gigantopithecus. There are a couple species of Gigantopithecus, uh, but we're including them all together here. This is an Asian ape, and it's cool because this is the largest primate that has ever lived. It first appeared about 9 million years ago in Asia, and it lived until as recently as 100,000 years ago. So this was a very successful group of primates uh, when it was alive. And the estimates on how large this ape was, they vary a lot, but no matter which way you look at it, this is a big ape. So the conservative estimates, the small estimates on its size, place Gigantopithecus at about six feet tall and maybe 400 pounds, which is larger than the average human. 
But at the upper end of the estimates, Gigantopithecus is estimated at 10 feet tall and about 1,200 pounds. So this is so much bigger than any human, uh, any, you know, any gorilla. This is really an outlier when it comes to the apes, but a very successful outlier. Now, it's a little bit difficult to uh, reconstruct the full body size of Gigantopithecus because no postcranial fossils have yet been found of uh, any Gigantopithecus gigantopithecus species. Only some tooth and some uh, mandible fossils have been found, so tooth and jaws. But based on those fossils and the size of them, and then using other living apes to sort of fill in the gaps, here's a reconstructed uh, gigantopithecus skull, okay, compared to a modern gorilla and a modern human. So an absolutely massive, massive creature. And here's an artist's reconstruction of what this ape might have looked like. Now, when we think about an ape this size, one of the questions we got to ask is, what did this individual eat? It is almost certainly a fruit and leaf eater, much like gorillas today or orang orangutans today. But you can also imagine for an ape that's 10 feet tall, that's a lot of leaves that it's got to eat in a day. So as soon as its environment started to disappear because of environmental change, this species goes extinct. And that probably is why it disappears around 100,000 years ago. So let's bring it back to the apes that we see in the world today and how they have split off over the last 16 or so million years. First, we have the gibbons and the siamangs. These are the lesser apes. And they live in Southeast Asia. They probably diverged from the rest of the ape line around 16 to 14 million years ago. They're a lot smaller than the other apes, only about a meter tall, 10 to 25 pounds. They're not very sexually dimorphic, and they tend to have one female, one male pair bonds that last throughout the lifetime. So rather than living in one male, multi-female groups, they do this, you know, more monogamous, you could say, style of mating. Gibbons are also the only true brachiators of all the primates. Brachiation is the word for this sort of swinging through the trees style of locomotion. So this is like, when you think of Tarzan, you're thinking of brachiation, but only the gibbons are the ones who really do it. And they have very specialized shoulder morphology to enable that swinging motion. All the other primates are more like clingers and leapers, but these guys are swingers. Next up are the orangutans, also a Southeast Asian ape. Uh, today they live only in Indonesia. They are a very solitary species. Um, so while they, you know, will live, infants certainly will stay with their mothers for a long period of time, they're noted as also being pretty solitary. And this might be due to the fact that they are extremely endangered, extremely endangered. And the biggest threat to orangutans is humans. And that's, that's been the case for a while. Um, orangutans are, are really at risk because of deforestation. Um, and especially when it comes to like palm oil, Harvesting trees for palm oil destroys the natural habitat of orangutans, and they don't tend to do very well when their habitat is destroyed, and a lot of them just die in the process. So orangutans are really at risk from human activity, uh, and it's you know something that we're all going to have to be sort of cognizant of as we move forward if these great apes are going to survive. Now, orangutans are very sexually dimorphic, with males being quite large compared to females. And males also develop this suite of characteristics, these big cheek flanges and kind of neck flaps and really long hair. This would be the, the super sexy male in the area if you were a female orangutan. They are arboreal climbers, so they live in trees, but they move pretty slowly and they mostly focus on eating fruits and leaves. Next up are the African hominids. That includes gorillas, bonobos, and chimps. We don't have a lot of fossil data on the African hominids, and that's because these are animals that live in the forest, and forests are really bad at preserving fossils. So unfortunately, when it comes to the African hominid fossil record, all we've got are a couple of teeth. And uh, the reason why teeth preserve is because the enamel preserves better than bone tissue. Uh, but you know, we've got these fossil gorilla teeth that are about 10 million years old and fossil chimpanzee teeth that are about half a million years old. And that's kind of it. But it appears that these African hominids diverged from the Asian hominids maybe 10 million years ago uh, when migrating back into Africa. 
gorillas today live in Central Africa. They're very endangered, again, because of deforestation, but also especially poaching. Gorillas are very sexually dimorphic. Males are about twice the size of females at 500 pounds for the males and 250 pounds for females. Gorillas are foliverous, so they eat leaves. They mostly stay on the ground, except they'll build small nests to get up off the forest floor at night. They are definitely knuckle walkers, and they typically have this sort of one male multi-female group, which feeds into this uh, fact of being very sexually dimorphic, right? So the big uh, silverback, the big alpha male, he has reproductive access, he has reproductive rights to the many females in his group. All right, our next apes are the chimps and the bonobos. Starting with chimps. We know that chimps and bonobos are our closest living relatives, um, and so we split from them around 7 million years ago. But we could also say that they split from us around 7 million years ago. Chimps today live in West and Central Africa. They eat fruit and occasionally leaves if they're really pressed for food, but we know that chimps love to eat meat, and hunting is a really important part of not only their diet, but also their social system. Chimps are less sexually dimorphic than gorillas or orangutans, uh, and many chimp groups use tools, whether it's termite fishing, which you can see in the bottom photo, where they'll take small twigs or pieces of grass and stick them into insect holes in order to sort of pull them out and eat them. Chimps will also crack nuts open using two rocks. So they have a, a real variety of tool use, which is very cool because we used to think that only humans made or used tools. Chimps are also a little bit more aggressive, um, especially between each other. They are very territorial and they'll make sure that other chimps aren't coming into their areas. When chimps do get into conflict, it can turn very dangerous for those individuals involved and they, they can easily be hurt or even sometimes killed. Now bonobos are sometimes called pygmy chimpanzees. They're a little bit smaller than chimps. Uh, they don't eat as much meat. In fact, I think only a few instances have ever been recorded of bonobos eating meat. But while chimps are noted as being more aggressive, and I'm not saying they're always fighting, but more prone toward aggression when conflict arises, bonobos swing hard the other way. And they have a very unique behavioral adaptation, which is that they use sex as a way of avoiding aggression. So rather than two bonobos getting into a fight over a piece of fruit, uh, as soon as that tension starts to arise, those two individuals will just very quickly have sex with each other. And then that, I guess, dissipates the tension. Uh, no one seems to care anymore about who gets the fruit. Uh, so these sexual pairings are often female and female or male and male. It's not always penetrative sex the way we would think of for reproduction, but it's sexual activity that is used to diffuse tension. This is a very cool adaptation because this makes bonobos the only other primates besides humans who use sex for something other than reproduction. Because bonobos and chimps are our closest living relatives, the fact that we see these two diverse strategies for resolving conflicts is interesting to us because, of course, humans kind of do both of those as well, right? We are aggressive and also we use other strategies, including sex, to solve problems. So by studying these living groups, we can better understand our own. The next group that I want to talk about is another fossil. This is called Sahelanthropus chadensis, and this is our possible last common ancestor with chimpanzees. This fossil was found in Chad in northern Africa, and it dates to about six or seven million years ago. Now, this is not going to be directly on the hominin line, or we don't want to call it only a hominin because we think it might be the group that actually sort of split and gave rise to chimps and bonobos on one side and humans on the other. The reason why we think that is because while it has some very obvious ap characteristics like this nice big brow ridge, small brain, big teeth, it does have hominin characteristics as well, things that are more similar to humans. And specifically, there's a characteristic called the foramen magnum, which is the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord inserts into the brain. In humans, the foramen magnum is centrally located, meaning it sits right at the bottom because we're essentially, you know, our heads are like lollipops on top of a stick, which is our spine. In chimps and bonobos and other apes, 
Chimps and bonobos and other apes, the foramen magnum sits a little bit further back, and that's because those are quadrupedal species. So the fact that we see that centrally located foramen magnum suggests that this might be the species that's, you know, that ultimately is the great, great, great grandfather of chimps, bonobos, and humans. And so then that brings us to our final ape group, the humans, or the homo sapiens. Now, obviously, the hominin evolutionary line has its own twists and turns and is an incredibly diverse and interesting story. But focusing just on the extant species, the humans, uh, we see that today we have a worldwide distribution, although originally we all come from Africa, with the first homo sapiens probably appearing around 300,000 years ago. We're less sexually dimorphic than a lot of other apes. We are omnivorous, meaning that we eat all types of foods. We've got very big brains, the, the largest brains relative to our body size out of all of the primates. We are bipedal, meaning that we walk upright on two legs, whereas everyone else walks on all fours. And not only that, we are obligate bipeds, meaning that we have to walk on two legs and we cannot go down to all fours if we wanted to. And of course, we're terrestrial. We're not spending our time in the trees anymore. We're doing all of our living on land. And then, of course, we have this one very unique uh, behavioral adaptation, uh, and that is culture. We do culture in a way that is so much more elaborated than other primates, although we do see elements of culture in other primate species. But our ability to take those seeds of culture and expand it into what we do today has undoubtedly allowed for our success around the world over the last 300,000 years. So those are our primates, our major primate groups, and just a little bit about our evolutionary history. And we've got a set of review questions to hit the main points of the lecture. So what features or tendencies do primates share? It's things like our opposable thumbs, our big brains, information through our eyes and through our hands. Number two, what are the main groups of living primates? We've got the lemurs, the lorises, the tarsiers, the new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and then the apes. When did primates first start evolving from the mammal lineage? It starts about 65 million years ago, right after dinosaurs go extinct. Uh, number four, how do we read fossils? What information can we discover about long extinct animals? So again, this is going back to the teeth to reconstruct diet and environment. We look at the eyes to tell us about when an animal is active. And we look at the postcrania to determine if we're looking at a terrestrial or arboreal species or one that's walking on all fours versus just two legs. Number five, what are the main groups of apes and how are they related? So we've got the gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, chimps, and humans. We know that bonobos and chimps are the most closely related, humans next, and then so on. Number six, what is sexual dimorphism? That's a large physical difference between males and females. And in primates, when we see large females, I'm sorry, when we see large males and smaller females, that tends to mean that we have multi-female single male groups. And then finally, the unique behavioral adaptation of bonobos is that they use sex to avoid aggression. All right, that is our primates lecture. We're a pretty amazing group.